We like to argue. Rams. Exactly. He's going to disagree about whether we like to argue. Here's the Patriots, Rams, Coors, Budweiser, skiing, snowboarding, Republican, Democrat. Don't answer that. Um, in America, we love to argue, and we get angry at each other, partly because there's something in us, partly there's something in our culture that just bubbles up, and uh, we, just, we just have to be right. In now, ancient Hebrew rabbis, they also loved to argue, maybe even more than us, uh, except when it came to describing God, and it came to talking about the life of faith, they were way more comfortable with just different ideas and different perspectives. They loved to argue, but they were okay with different ideas. America would love to argue with this. Go ahead. Um, eventually, you know, if you know uh, Orthodox Jewish people today, they decided that when it came to things like worshiping God, uh, often for them that was so important, the details really mattered, and they had to get it just right. It's kind of like the way I, I understand it is, in the Super Bowl, you want to have you know, the referees in the right place, and the camera angle is just right, and the rules just set up, because it's too important to make a mistake. And for some Jews uh, today, worship, you know, it's, it's too important to make a mistake, so you get kosher laws, you get Sabbath rest, which is kind of cool idea. Um, but for ancient Hebrew rabbis, God was difficult. God was bigger than anything we could hold on to. God was bigger than our arguments. Prayer was different because there's so many ways to prayer. Living out your faith, how to love the world, what to stand for, what to stand against. It's fun to argue, but ancient rabbis, they thought there were plenty of right answers. Not just one. Plenty of right answers. So in the Jewish commentaries that were written just a, a few hundred years um, after Jesus died, the way it looks, right, right in the beginning, the first one, a, a rabbi, like let's say Rabbi Abraham says, I think the morning prayer, you should say the morning prayer right when you get up because it shows uh, your priorities of your day. Makes sense. But then Rabbi Benjamin would say, I think the morning prayer should be said right when the sun comes up because that's the way to bring God's light into your life. Also makes sense. So then Rabbi Daniel would say, you're both very faithful, but I think what matters is that your heart is prepared for the prayer. Okay? And they don't just keep arguing until someone's right. They just let that sit there, which is kind of nice. It'd be a, a neat world. And so they do that for dozens of pages on that one prayer. They do it for all kinds of things. How to treat your animals faithfully, how to cook your food spiritually, how to talk to your partner compassionately, everything. And with these kinds of things, they were more, they were more or less fine with no definitive answer. And even when it came to how to repair the world, there were different ideas, different perspectives, plenty of discussion, but at least with the most enlightened rabbis, there were plenty of things they could agree to disagree about. Not everything. That you said the morning prayer, you better do it. Uh, that you treat your animals well and talk to your partner compassionately, you better do that. Uh, that your faith leads you to want to repair the world, to want to repair the world, unquestionably. That there was a source self-evident. How to describe that source, how to interact with that source, lots of room. How to repair the world, lots of room. 1,500 years later, after nearly a century of Christians killing themselves over whether Jesus was in the bread or of the body or became this or that, who knows really what was going on. But um, people really got arguing about that. And eventually, this, this Christian way, trying to restore peace in the world, uh, they had this slogan, in matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, love. Faith, unity. Opinion, liberty. In all things. Which sounds, sounds kind of nice, but in unity in matters of faith implies there are matters of faith to be unified about. Which implies there are better ways and there are worse ways. So for instance, if your religion, not here, but if your religion were to cause you to hate other people, you're wrong. You're just wrong. If your faith is so weak that political allegiances allow you to promote suffering, you're just wrong. But once we get on the right page, we are together. Once we get on the right page about the most important things, we can learn from that restoration motto from the ancient Hebrew rabbis, from the perspectives that we can share in these peers, that there are a lot of ways to trust, a lot of ways to be loved. For instance, our scriptures today offer two very different models for repairing the world. In Luke, the second one, Jesus says that small acts of love will grow slowly, almost on their own. Almost like that's the way it should be. Almost like God has set it up, so you put it there, and it grows. You put it out there, it grows. It does its thing. Even this small seed, and mustard is neither a tree nor the smallest seed, but um, you know, it's what it is. Mustard is a weed uh, that takes over your whole field. If you've ever grown mustard, then it just gets into your garden, and you cannot get rid of it. Um, Jesus says this small seed of love, with the right conditions, it might just grow and grow and grow until it chokes out your anger, 
It chokes out your shame, it chokes out your pride, it chokes out the brokenness. It has a way of taking over. In the same way, he says, this tiny bit of yeast, look what it can do to a loaf of dough. When you have the patience, when you get out of the way, and let love do its work, it creates something so much more valuable. Jesus didn't say it this way, but brewers know it's true. Same thing with yeast in beer. You can't really call it beer unless it's got yeast. You can manipulate the temperature and ingredients, time, anything, but without something like yeast, it's not going to be beer. Little things, given the right conditions, are often the only way to repair the world. Amen? <laughs> the biggest changes with the most lasting effects come from transforming little hearts, little by little, until they grow into large movements. That's one model. However, David read another story. We do not always have the time or the right conditions, and sometimes waiting to let small actions multiply might be ineffective, even sinful, because sometimes God calls us not simply to reshape the world for lasting effects, but to act with intention dramatically now. And sometimes God calls us to act now because otherwise terrible things will happen to feel God loves. In another story that Jesus tells also about wheat, if you toss your wheat out on the uh, your wheat seed out onto the sidewalk, or it's the wrong time of the year, or it's the middle of a mustard patch, it ain't gonna grow. You can be as faithful as you want. You can wait there. Oh, please, Jesus, make that wheat grow. Ain't gonna grow. You, you can pray all you want, trust all you want, no wheat. You have to put it in the soil. You have to break up the soil. You have to plant it right, you have to keep away the weeds at the right time. And then, only then, you might have bakers and brewers, if you put the yeast in at the wrong time, or at the wrong temperature, or without the right amount of sugar, it just won't rise. I don't care how faithful you are, it's not going to work. You have to do it. You have to knead it just right, or heat it just right. You have to wait, and then you'll have bread. So in our second story, these Hebrew people in Egypt, they did not have the luxury of waiting for love to play out. It was not getting better on its own. God was not going to prepare this for them. The moral arc of the universe was not bending anywhere without them doing the bending. Deuteronomy is, when I mean, he started that talking about these weird months of the Hebrew the calendar, which is a little weird. It tells more exciting stories in Exodus, but they use the same word in here. The, the word, the important one special word that only shows up one other time in the whole Bible, a word that most of us don't think of as spiritual. In fact, most of us think that it's the opposite of spirituality. Uh, the translation that David read was haste. Uh, they had to leave in haste, make their bread in haste and leave in haste, which doesn't sound spiritual. But the word, um, uh, uh, the hippazon, that one's a little trickier than the ones I taught you earlier. Uh, the hippazon is not just about time, it's not just about speed, it's about anxiety. It's about that itching at your heart that something's not right, you have to do it, you have to fix it right now. It's about that, that feeling that parents get when, they're, when their kids aren't home and you know when, when the curfew goes. It's about that, that feeling that just, I, I have to do something, I have to get up, I can't sit still. The hippazon. And the connotation here is make your bread and eat it and get out there with panic haste. It's not about patience trust. It's about demanding. Do it. Don't wait. And in that situation, when the Hebrew people were faced with a corrupt government that oppressed people racially and economically, and a government in a fever to control women's bodies, the Hebrews did not have the right to simply trust God to take care of them. They did not have the right to simply be kind to each other and hope that love would spread all the way up to the Pharaoh. In this situation, maybe in other situations, waiting to let the yeast work its way through meant death. God said, move now. Don't wait for the yeast. Don't even add it. God did not tell them to be patient and faithful. God told them to be troubled and faithful because repairing the world demanded they not wait for Pharaoh to break more lives. So which one do we do? Do we follow Jesus' parable or God's command? Patient or, or urgent? I mean, one has to be right, right? No. One does not have to be right for all people in all situations. They could both be right in their place, which of course begs the question that I think um, we had an answer for in the children's sermon. Um, when should we be patient and faithful? When should we plant tiny seeds of love that God waters so that one day, slowly, that repairs the world, 
And when should we be disturbed and faithful and fix things now without hesitation and without apology to Pharaoh? And if you know the answer to that, you should be preaching. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, if you don't have an answer to that, let's, let's take away some answers you can't have. The Bible says, absolutely not. You cannot always have Peter Pan faith. Just believe it and it's going to happen. And absolutely not. You cannot just be always militant where you're always rushing to take down the overlords. There's a time for every season. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down, a time to sow up. A time to love, a time to hate. A time for war, a time for peace. The question is, what time is it? And if you're kind of new around here and that sounded like the birds, I'm not quoting the birds, the birds were quoting the Bible. Um, Ecclesiastes, <laughs> who is this very weird Old Testament preacher. And to be fair, this is not Ecclesiastes at his best sometimes. I'm not at my best. Ecclesiastes was so worn down by the brokenness of the world that he did not know what to do next. He was at a loss. Maybe you can relate. Some days he figured, some days he was strong, and he thought, the only way to make a change in the whole world is to change my heart. So I'm going to love, love, love. Other days, the only way to put the pieces back together is to blow the whole thing up. Other days, oh, you will relate to this one. Other days, either side is too hard. How could he live with integrity to face up to evil out there and the balance to keep engaging? So he gave up. Eat, drink, be merry. That's all you have until you're going to die. He said that too. He did not say that necessarily as God's commandment more as a human moment. Do I fight? Do I love? Am I paralyzed? And I fall down into eating and drinking. He said that as a human moment because life is hard and sometimes the world seems so beyond repair. I just want to get away. Which is probably why God commands us to rest. So that we can come back from compassion fatigue. So that we can rejoin the fights worth fighting. So we can think fresh, what time is this? What is the holy thing for me to do in this situation, for me in this situation? It's a question you have, how do I deal with my family faithfully when all they do is fight? It's a question you have, maybe how do I express myself on Facebook, hopefully, when so many people are so hell-bent on breaking the world? How do I look into someone's eyes lovingly when they have staked their claims so bewilderingly far from God's will? Should I be yeast and trust God to leverage my patience into their hearts, maybe? Or am I called to panic haste to an unleavened justice, never forgetting the evils that happened then, never naive about the evils that can be brought now? I can't answer that for you. Frankly, if I could answer it for you, you probably wouldn't agree with me. I can't ask the question framed by the holy tradition of men and women who have wrestled with God and striven to live faithfully. Now I can answer for myself. I know how I often answer. I know how I like to answer. Although, so often afterwards I think, ooh, I could have been more like yeast. Ooh, I could have, you know, I shouldn't have missed that opportunity to speak God's holy word into that situation. So I, but I know my tendency. And I know what comes as natural. You know what comes as natural for you. And if I'm honest with myself, because I know what comes so natural for me, because I'm comfortable in one style of repairing the world, Maybe that itself should tell me to practice more in the other direction. Maybe that should tell you to practice more in the other direction. I don't know, but I pray that God shines light.